Welcome to episode two of the Hypercast podcast. Uh, we've got John and Miguel with us from BreachBits, and today we're going to be learning about ransomware. Um, all right, guys, so my first question is, as a user, what would happen if I got infected by ransomware? So, like, just walk me through what I would see start to happen on my computer. Sure. So um, now we could assume that, so let's assume that um, the user was infected from ransomware through some external attack vector, right? Um, unfortunately, from a user's uh, point of view, uh, they might not see much until it's already too late, right? Mm -hmm. So the typical way a ransomware might reveal itself to the victim user is after it's been encrypted, might either do a number of things, right? Either show some sort of scary looking pop up, kind of telling you, hey, your files have been hacked, here's where you can find them, and maybe, and then some details, including um, maybe ransom payments or instructions on how to decrypt your files, right? Um, and while there could be pop-ups, there could also be just folders left on a desktop, maybe encrypted, called encrypted files here, right? Some sort of indicator to show you, hey, scary stuff goes here, right? Um, almost always what the user is because this is what the malicious actor cares about, our instructions on how to pay the ransom, right? So that said, because of the nature of their attack, there's not much to be done from a victim perspective, right? Um, until the attack is over. Um, yeah. It's now, like, if you look from a as a person, yeah. I wouldn't notice the attack going on until my files had been encrypted and the message gets put up. And at that point, yeah. there's nothing really I can do. If they've if they've executed the ransomware tactic correctly, then all of the information I have on my computer has been encrypted, and they are the only ones with the key. Correct. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Um, funny enough, uh, I, I've heard that a lot of the ransomware companies actually have significantly better uh, customer support than some of the large corporations in America because if they don't, then people won't pay them. <laughs> it's 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 funny. You see sometimes on the, the ransomware notes, they leave almost a, a friendly customer service guarantee, right? Yeah. Oh, like, uh, if you pay us, we promise we'll give you your files back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's what I can experience as a user if I get ransomware. Um, I won't notice anything. Maybe my computer runs a little bit slow as all my stuff is being encrypted. And then one day, a dialog pops up and says, hey, we've successfully encrypted all the important stuff on your hard drive. And if you ever want to get any of that information back, you need to pay up and then we'll give you the decryption key and then it'll get wiped off your computer more or less yep. yeah all right so that's that's what ransomware is uh next question would be so like how does ransomware actually get into my network or onto sure, so, my computer itself yeah so i mean ransomware uh essentially is just a piece of malware with the specific purpose of encrypting files right so the same way a company could expect any malware to get inside their network externally is the same way a ran ransomware would, right? So we're talking uh, phishing, um, maybe exploiting a public-facing servers that a company has, or using something like leak credentials to log into a public-facing VPN pool, right? Um, like I said, once eternal access has been gained uh, from an attacker, essentially follows the same same path as a traditional uh, traditional attack, right? Gotcha. The only difference specifically to ransomware to other malware, like I said, is its purpose of encrypting the files uh, for the purpose of payment, right? Gotcha. Okay, so for those, just in case no, uh, somebody's watching this episode that hasn't seen the first episode, walk me through how you, as a professional hacker, would get ransomware deployed onto my computer here at Hypercube. And we'll just go through the steps. So starting from scratch, sure, so, you've got me as a target. Walk us through your plan of attack. Sure. So starting from scratch uh, with you, uh, Hypercube as a target, um, the first thing an attacker is going to do is try to enumerate anything that uh, your company, your target organization would have accessible to them on the internet, right? 
uh, system targets, human targets, um, services running uh, publicly, uh, stuff like I said, like I mentioned before, um, leak credentials maybe. So maybe look through uh, leak dump or search the dark web for any credentials or anything related to Hypercube. And then try to find, utilize any of the information gathered during that reconnaissance phase uh, to gain internal access, right? So this is the stage where you might have identified, let's say phishing is, is, ends up being my um, method of access, right? Maybe in the reconnaissance phase, I use public tools to scrape. I use tools to scrape public uh, databases like maybe LinkedIn or social media accounts to gather a list of human targets, right? And now I have a list of human targets. I conduct a phishing attack. And let's say in this phishing attack, I embed a Word document. And when you open a Word document with a macro enable, it'll download and run some malware. The malware in this case happening to be ransomware, right? Gotcha. Okay, so a ransomware attack up until the actual ransomware gets released follows all the same procedures that any other normal hack would. I try and find my targets, I identify a target, I send out a bunch of emails trying to get them to click on something they're not supposed to, they run something, the attacker gets a foothold on their computer, and from that point they chose to run the, the payload that the attacker delivered in this case was ransomware. Yep, and that's sure. and that's in the standpoint that uh, the attacker was trying to target Hypercube uh, directly. Mm -hmm. There also is, um, you know, with some of the most prevalent ways that um, groups deploying ransomware are getting in today, um, phishing, like Miguel said, um, exposed remote desktop protocol um, and exposed uh, VPN uh, portals to log in. Some of those may not be tied back to Hypercube or a Hypercube domain. It just may be a target of opportunity that may have some weak credentials or somehow uh, an attacker was able to get some exposed credentials. Uh, and they may not even know what organization they're breaking into when they uh, conduct that initial access. Gotcha. So unlike, unlike some of the other techniques isn't the right word, as an attacker, I can either target an individual or I can cast a really wide net and hope to make money off of anything that gets caught in that net. And yep. in ransomware's case, well actually this is a question, in ransomware's case, do you guys think or have you seen or do you know of any statistics as to whether hackers are targeting people com and companies with ransomware? or if they're just casting a super wide net and hoping they catch anybody and then trying to monetize monetize that? I think it's a combination of the two. Um, some of the larger groups um, will be a bit more targeted in who they go after because they're looking for you know a very large uh, ransom payday. Mm -hmm. um, but we do see a lot of groups that um, will have a particular initial access vector that's um, that they know works well, and they'll just try to cast a wide net and find every um, you know version of the targeted uh, VPN that they're looking for, or remote desktop protocol hosts exposed to the internet, uh, things like that. So some combination of the two. Okay, so a lot of times it's not they find a victim and then run down a list of exploits to try and go after that victim. It's they find an exploit and they just scan the internet for anything vulnerable to that exploit. Mix of both. It's safe to say it's a mix of both. Um, building on what John said, there, there are um, samples out there now, like ransomware samples of white papers that show um, some ransomware when they first uh, land in a network before even conducting anything malicious, they enumerate this to target that they want to attack, right? For example, um, Colonial, I believe the dark side ransomware excluded any countries where the language was Russian speaking, Polish, and then a few others, right? Um, I know other other samples have uh, built in checks to make sure that they're not in a government entity, right? Because some companies uh, in their friendly customer service model uh, say that they won't go after governments, right? Um, yeah. So things like that. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. I'd never thought about that before. Like, if I were, uh, if I put myself in the shoes of a hacker, I don't want this ransomware to uh, to encrypt a U.S. government computer because then they'll turn that information over to the NSA and then I have the NSA coming after me. 
Whereas if it encrypt if it encrypts grandma's laptop that she uses to Skype with her grandkids, she probably does not have the same resources to deploy yeah. against me as a, a nation state might. It's yeah, interesting. safe to assume. Yeah. <laughs> that that kind of makes sense. Yeah. All right. So um, at, here at Hypercube, we use G Suite, right? We use the Google suite of tools to manage and run the company. So if I have my important files stored in Google Drive, am I safe from ransomware or do they have some way to encrypt those files as well? Good, go ahead, John. Yeah, so I would say um, most likely for most um, cloud storage services, um, they provide you a way to store them in the cloud um, for you know redundancy and to be able to share them across devices. But you're also likely to have uh, local copies on your host machine that you operate out of. So what we've seen um, uh, threat groups do um, more and more these days are not only ransom, not only encrypt the files that they may find on your hard drive. So um, you know for the local copies of those G Suite files that you mentioned. Um, they'll encrypt them, but they'll also exfiltrate them back uh, to make sure that, um, you know, in that case, you may have backups that you can easily uh, replicate those files. Um, but more and more often, the attackers will come back and say, we have your files. If you don't want them, if you want them back, or if you don't want them released publicly, then pay the ransom. So it's one other way they're able to exert some sort of influence uh, and ah. uh, push you to pay, even if you have a way um, to to replicate and to um, back up those files. Okay, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. So it's not just I've locked your computer, and if you want your computer back, you have to pay us. It's by the way. I've scanned your entire future computer, taken all of the, you know, maybe I captured your internet browsing history, your Google search history, basically all the information that's on that computer. And unless you want us, I guess if you're, especially if you're a prominent figure, unless you want us to post all that stuff online, we also would like you to pay us. Yeah, right. Because even if you have... <clears throat> even if you have a backup of it, right, and you were stored on your computer, that doesn't stop the threat actor from still releasing the, the private right. information, right? I mean, I guess at the end of the day, so there, there's probably some interesting market forces going on here, right? So hackers have been able to get unauthorized access to people's computers for a long time. And since ransomware seems to be the most popular thing happening to get today, I guess what, what has happened is the best way if we pretend that hacking is just a business, then the best way to monetize the fact that I've hacked someone's computer is through ransomware now. I mean, if there were a better way to monetize that, my guess would be the hackers would be doing it. Um, okay. And as, uh, as uh, organizations are getting better and better about backing uh, those files up, that's why we see kind of this rise of um, another way of exerting pressure uh, by uh, threatening to release things publicly. And uh, an true. even uh, further way that that is manifesting itself uh, to exert more pressure on the, the victim is uh, there have also been threat groups that have uh, broken in, exfiltrated files, found customer data, and mm -hmm. gone to those customers directly uh, and threatened to release the files if they didn't exert some pressure on the victim organization um, as one more way to try to force them to pay the ransom. Gotcha. Okay. Another, another reason, building on what you said, Craig, why I think uh, it's becoming so popular in terms of monetization, right? Like, sure, traditional attack, uh, an attacker can gain access to an internal network, right? Let's say laterally move get domain admin and then do things like either sell access or sell data that he found, but that takes time, right? If you take the cost to time ratio for ransomware, it, you can't beat it, right? Because like we discussed, it's kind of a run one and done type thing if it's successful and bypasses any preventative measures, right? Gotcha. Um, all right, so what, what can I do to protect 
myself or my organization from ransomware. Is there anything easy I can do? Well, I, I think building on what we said before, it kind of goes back to just securing your external perimeter, right? Whether that be with uh, email monitoring solutions or just keeping up to date with your uh, EDR solutions, antivirus solutions, right? Because it, where, whereas sure some ransomware, when it, when it drops on disk, it'll run uh, additional things other than encrypting your files, right? Um, it can run privs techniques. It'll, it'll mo almost certainly run some sort of lateral movement uh, across the network in order to maximize the impact, right? Um, but the actual act of encrypting files are tough to detect from antivirus, right? And EDR solutions. And I'm sure now uh, with the recent climate, uh, they're getting better. But at the end of the day, what's actually happening programmatically is just a bunch of files being copied, um, encrypted with libraries that are almost always supported by Windows by default and, and then deleted, right? With administrative privileges. So can you, it, it's tough to weed out the false positives that can come with, let's say, just setting an alert for deleting 100 files, right, as an administrator. Yeah. So um, while, like I said, while all that stuff is definitely possible, I think the most secure the, the most effective way to be secure is to take the preventative measures when it comes to external uh, attack surface, right? I don't know if John has anything else to add, but... Yeah, yeah. so like we said, the um, uh, since the initial steps of most ransomware campaigns just like look like any other uh, attack, having those security, those depth hints and depth measures to detect the, the lateral movement, privilege escalation, things like that, so those endpoint security um, solutions are very important for ransomware in particular, um, you know, having an idea of what the most popular initial access vectors are and what kind of exposures you're providing, uh, to those type of threats is important. So, uh, ensuring that you, if you have any hosts that are exposed, uh, to the internet through remote desktop protocol, that's very, uh, a very common target for malware, uh, knowing, uh, if you have any hosts that, uh, have that. Uh, if you have exposed VPN portals um, that uh, your employees use, make sure that if it's possible and have multi-factor authentication uh, so that even if credentials are exposed or are weak, um, it at least slows down a potential uh, attacker. And knowing how well your security solutions um, are able to stop downloads uh, from spear phishing emails. So mm -hmm. downloading that malicious Word document that will run a macro and put something malicious on disk, like uh, Miguel said, those are all uh, things to kind of be aware of and to know how your security stacks up against them. Gotcha. Okay. And that's actually something, something I have personally been preaching to other, other enterprises, my friends who run other companies is, you know, you can buy and pay for all the security stuff in the world, but you should really test to make sure you're getting your money's worth, right? Like, at the very least, you should know that the stuff I have paid for can stop those very common attack vectors. Exactly. And not because the vendor told you it would stop it, but because you had someone try and you actually measured it and you said, no, it totally stopped it. It's like you would never, you would never believe a car manufacturer that they have the safest car in the world. That's why we have crash tests and safety things. And so why don't you crash test your network? Um, this is a little plug for my company, Hypercube, but in the past, it's been really difficult to crash test your network because you would literally break the thing that makes your company money. Um, but with Hypercube, you can make a copy of the thing that makes your company money and run all these tests in a completely risk-free environment to make sure that all the expensive cybersecurity software you've paid for, you're getting your money's worth. But... Um, so we, we talked, we covered what ransomware is, um, how it gets into your network, what actually happens once it gets into your network. Um, some common practices that the average user could take specific to ransomware that might help them. So there's the standard security stuff they should be doing to detect the top ways any malware gets onto their computer. But for ransomware specifically, it seems to me like if I kept my files backed up in a location that ransomware could not encrypt from my regular computer, and 
I didn't keep anything I wouldn't mind getting exposed on my regular computer, I should be okay. I mean, what it really sounds like is, from an economic standpoint, the reason I would pay a ransomware guy is they have something I don't want released. It would be a giant pain in the ass for me to wipe my computer and rebuild it from scratch. And they've locked me out of information that I desperately need. So if I had that information stored somewhere else and... I had nothing on my computer that I would particularly care about getting released and I had a way to rebuild my computer from scratch if I got infected by ransomware that would render the threat of ransomware, while it would be kind of annoying, not a, oh crap, my business is toast. For uh um, I would say, in general, yes, as long as there aren't other hosts that are reachable by um, the threat that landed on your computer. Yeah, so when I was referring to, so here's a, here's a good example, right? Like, um, I can upload files into Google Drive. I don't know if I can still do this, but there used to be a way for me to mount Google Drive as a drive on my computer. And if I did that, then the ransomware would be able to get access to that drive and overwrite all those files with encrypted versions, and it would be a huge pain to get it all back. So as long as, uh, I guess that's something else you should think about. Like, If someone had access to my computer right now, what other resources can they see or possibly pivot to that they could also encrypt? Um, for companies that have large prem on-prem installations, this could be huge because they could have you know, they could have a giant NAS that has shared drives for everyone attached, you know, on it. And if a piece of ransomware gets in, it could figure out a way to, you know, if they could figure, if a hacker could figure out a way to escalate privileges to the point where they could write anywhere on that NAS, all of a sudden everyone's corporate shared drive becomes an encrypted piece of garbage that they need to pay to get unlocked. Yep. Yeah. And like, while while not all ransomware obviously is the same, uh, every every attack differs uh, by attacker, right? One thing that is uh, common throughout, and I think safe to say, potentially all could do is try to gain administrative access and spread before running the ransomware, right? Yeah. Because a ransomware campaign with three computers and an organization with two thousand isn't isn't going to make them blink an eye, right? So. The, the more advanced, advanced threat actors for sure won't deploy the ransomware unless they've established a sufficient enough foothold to make it worth it, right? Yep. Hmm. I wonder if any of the ransomware companies have opened cybersecurity consulting firms which come in after ransomware has attacked, promising to remove it as long as you have the key. <laughs> be interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, we should not apply our entrepreneurial tendencies to figuring out the most efficient way to run a ransomware company. <laughs> uh, but um, all right, so in that case, uh, can you guys show us some ransomware in action? Sure. So um, we have an attack on demand feature here uh, that allow us to pretty much run a ransomware, common ransomware technique on a single host or spread throughout if a customer so decides. Um, so. Before I run it, I just want to give a quick uh, description of how, of kind of what's going on mm -hmm. on a high level. So uh, as we know, there are several different um, ransomware techniques that have been released publicly recently um, using all different types of encryption schemes. So for the purpose of this demo, we'll be using one with a hybrid RSA AES encryption scheme. So what that means without getting too deep into the weeds, there's two set of keys, right? So there's the one set of key, which everyone thinks thinks of immediately, The in our case, the AES key, right? Um, key pair, I should say, the public private key that's used to actually encrypt and decrypt the files, right? Um, so now I, what someone would think is, okay, so if I encrypt the files with AES key uh, in memory, right, wouldn't a researcher be able to just get it out of memory, right? Do some reverse engineering, find it, and then decrypt, the, decrypt all the files, right? So that's where the second key pair comes in, right? So what the, this piece of uh, ransomware will do and many others do is first we'll generate the public private key for the attacker, right? So that'll be an RSA private public key pair 
the private key will be kept by me, the attacker, and then the public key will be hard coded into the malware, right? So um, I want to stop you for just a second and talk love. about RSA encryption real quick. So the the um, I as a uh, people may not know, but I was studying to get my PhD in mathematics, and one of the things that I studied at a graduate level was. Uh, encryption and specifically RSA and some of the tactics you can use to try and break RSA. So here's here's RSA encryption 101. Um, I got I have two giant numbers. The first number is the public key and with the public key I can encrypt things. The second number is the private key. I cannot decrypt things with the public key. All I can do is encrypt them. I need the private key in order to decrypt them. So in some sense, the public-private key pair for, uh, for RSA is like a lock and a physical key. The yep. public key is the lock, and I can lock anything I want, but the only thing the only thing that could possibly unlock it is the private key. And the other thing is there's no good way to go from the public key to the private key. That's like a there's no way to reverse engineer that. No. And if you really want to get into some details, if you guys want to do some research, I'm saying you guys, if our audience wants <laughs> to look up cool stuff about RSA, um, the first way they implemented it was with prime numbers. So if you have two giant prime numbers and you multiply them together, that gives you a public key. If you have a giant number to figure out what two prime numbers multiplied together to give you that, is really, really, really hard, especially yeah. as the number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but actually these days, they found out a more secure way and they do it using um, elliptic curves. So they mm. use elliptic curve cryptography. It still generates the public and private key, but um, it's, it's pretty cool stuff if you wanna go look it up. Plus you get to draw yeah. some neat pictures. Anyway, that's my that's my no, that, that's my that's little actually, info on uh, RSA and public private key encryption. That's actually helpful. So building off of that analogy, right? The key and the lock, right? The private key being the lock, uh, the key, I'm sorry, and the public key being the lock. What the public key is locking in this scenario, and many others in ransomware, is the private key for the AES encryption that is being used to encrypt uh, every file, right? Okay. So what an attacker I'm um, sorry, what the victim is looking to actually decrypt is the RSA locked or encrypted AES private key, which can then be used to decrypt all the encrypted files, right? So I can share my screen here and kind of run through our attack on demand feature here for that. So here we have uh, insider module here for our sample company. So we go up here and I can request a new insider attack. So here we have breach pitch ransomware emulation. So this is gonna do exactly what I just described. Um, while this sets up here, our infrastructure will set up uh, some attacking host to run the, the attack here. Um, something else, so in order to prevent obviously damaging any customer running this, we don't encrypt um, actual system files, right? Mm -hmm. So what the attack's gonna do here is create a, project directory on the desktop folder. Ransomware is gonna select uh, 500 random files from the system, and then it'll encrypt those files, however, in the sample directory without deleting the original, right? So what the okay, customer so is getting- so it's just gonna make a copy of them, put them in the sample directory and encrypt them. Encrypt the copies and then delete the copies, which would in a real attack be the original, right? Um, on top of that, the ransomware is gonna take some additional steps like we mentioned before that uh, real attackers might, right? So Query startup registry keys, maybe change them to a sample default, change them back just to imitate, uh, maybe adding persistence, right? Uh, query the system language settings to make sure we're targeting only the countries we want to go after, and then proceed with the ransomware process, right? Uh, something else that's noticeably not in here just for the purpose of uh, the demonstration is a potential lateral movement throughout the network to spread the ransomware, right? Mm -hmm. So it should be all queued up and ready to go now. Yeah, so we can play the attack here. This is the execution script. Download and run that. All 
Okay. So here we have our execution window here, providing some details on the connectivity test and the location of the output. And we're gonna start the attack. Kind of minimize this and just wait. All right, so here we go. So this is just our version of a sample scary pop-up window you might see uh, with the time, usually some some countdown, something scary to intimidate them, right? Uh, what we don't have included here because we're not actual bad guys is a URL to go get your uh, decryption key, but add a little message, the total, the random number of files it's selected to encrypt, and then the location of, of where you might find those files, right? Now you can see here, if we go to the project directory, see a bunch of files, I believe 194 is a number, all encrypted with AES-256. So another, a common way attackers will let you know you're viewing the encrypted file is by adding the encryption method as the file type at the end, right? So gotcha. let's open a random text file that's now encrypted. Notepad. Takes a little while because, yep, and you can see here, we just have a bunch of jumbled, unreadable yep. stuff there, so. So another one just to make sure. Yeah. So with this, you can kind of test and I can go back to the timeline here, the attack timeline and we can show all the steps that the ransomware took, right? So this will provide a timeline for the attack and uh, pretty much display to the user whether what part of the attack succeeded or failed. So you see here the run DLL32 execution, which is this our sample loader we chose to use. Mm -hmm. That's gonna actually load the malware uh, the ransomware, sorry, into memory, and then execute it. And then you could see here, it's just taking the steps that we mentioned before, right? So using the Windows API to check the system language, see that was a success. Um, querying the registry for startup programs, right? Adding a fake startup key. And here, getting a recursive list of the files. Uh, this is queuing them, uh, taking out the files that we don't want to encrypt, right? Uh, executables, DLLs. And then at the end here, the event for the actual encryption, right? So the viewer can look at this and now basically determined on, uh, based on the output of this timeline, can determine what parts of the attack were successful or stopped or whatnot. Gotcha, that's, I'm jealous of that dashboard. That's a pretty cool dashboard. John, I don't know if I, if I missed anything, if you want to add anything else, but. Yep, no, I think uh, it was a great overview and just one more kind of reminder, you know, this is the, what we're replicating here is not the entire scope of uh, a ransomware engagement. It's, you know, the end um, uh, after an attacker has already got in, moved laterally and determined that this was the time to deploy the ransomware. But as you can see, even with um, security uh, and antivirus on, it's a very difficult um, part of the attack to disrupt uh, and detect. Yeah. Um, talk to me more about the the breach bits remote attack capability. So, I haven't uh, I haven't got a chance to play around with that as much. So the the computer you're you're dealing with here, um, can you show the topology of what you're working on? No, nope. sorry, here that was. Uh... Um, sorry about that. <laughs> no sweat. A little break here. Oh yeah, so this is a single host. So this is just a regular, so I have a, in Hypercube here, set up a sample AD lab here. We have a few domain controllers, internet gateway, and then a few hosts, right? Okay. Um, so what I'm running on here is just a standard Windows 10 domain join host, right? Um, traditionally, if now if we wanted to, we could open this up on a bunch of different hosts or our customers could have the option to send this attack to other hosts, right? Gotcha, so this is, uh, this remote attack capability is something that, as a as a customer of BreachBits, I could put this on my computer, and then it would allow me to run different attack simulations to verify that my um, my all the defensive software I've purchased is actually working. Yep, exactly. So we have. Uh, some single host tests that test against very specific types of tactics and techniques. Uh, and we also have uh, network assessments, which will combine those tactics and techniques in an orchestrated engagement um, 
that allow you to do exactly what you said, test your network security and your defense and depth layers, yep. uh, all without putting an agent or having to install anything uh, in your network. Gotcha. That is the, pretty cool. And a, an additional benefit to build on what John said about just kind of making the note on how we didn't include, I guess, the full breadth of a ransomware, right? Because we didn't include the initial access. It, some some people might want to get tested and have that the whole path included. But now let, let's say your antivirus catches the privilege escalation method used in a ransomware attack, right? Um, you can say great and done. Okay, we stopped a ransomware attack. But in reality, you stopped the privilege escalation using the ransomware and your antivirus might not have even gotten the opportunity to even see how it would react, right? To, to a ransomware actually being executed when it comes down to the encrypting of files, right? So these kind of standalone attack on demand kind of just give you an option to specifically test a specific module in a standalone way, right? Yep. Very cool, very cool. All right, well, uh, this, this has been the uh, introduction to ransomware. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, is there anything you guys want to plug? While you're while you're here on the podcast, sure. Yeah, uh, as uh, Miguel demoed, uh, that uh, capability is part of our continuous intelligent red team or CERT service. Uh, so that what uh, he demonstrated was part of our insider threat module. Uh, but we also have different modules that test your every level of your security from your perimeter. Um, detecting and uh, testing your external attack vectors for ransomware in particular, like the exposed remote desktop protocol hosts, VPN portals, things like that, to see how uh, how well they can keep out uh, an attacker. And then moving into your network, uh, like Miguel showed, our insider threat capability. Gotcha. Um, have you guys, has anyone reached out to you yet to do and or host a like red versus blue team event? for them. The reason I say that is that um, what you got, what you guys just showed, it I think it would be really cool to have an enterprise's team of defenders each get assigned a machine in that topology and then have you guys go after it and have them have to respond to things live. But so we have uh, um, worked with some organizations that do those type of uh, engagements but for the most part, uh, with most of our customers, that's the type of daily interaction we have with them. You know, we provide the uh, the safe red team uh, assessor that's trying to break in, mm -hmm. and they're doing their daily work, making sure that their uh, their actions and software are keeping us out. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, it's a real life uh, red and blue team engagement. <laughs> I gotcha. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for being on the podcast and uh, look forward to the next one.